So a little bit of a, um, an instruction about uh, the history behind TG20, uh, what's new, uh, and then I'll show you the new, uh, the, the, the new version. Um, so yeah, a bit back CADS. Um, we've been um, going for more than 40 years now. Um, we provide um, construction software and services um, with um, more than 500 uh, structural engineers and software developers. Um, and as well as developing TG20, um, I also started with the uh, Smart Scaffolder software range, if you've seen that. Uh, and before that, also our range of uh, structural analysis and design software uh, for structural engineers. Um, so TG20 really started with the uh, withdrawal of um, BS5973 back in, in 2003. Um, so uh, for those who haven't heard this already, um, the British standard was replaced with a uh, Eurocode, uh, EN12811. Um, and anyone who's seen the two documents will see they're quite different. Uh, the British standard was, was quite a practical document um, with lots of guidance for um, the practical applications of scaffolding. Uh, whereas 12811 is uh, very much um, a document about the analysis and design of uh, scaffolding by calculation. Um, so the withdrawal of the British standard left a, a bit of a vacuum, uh, which TG20 sought to fill. Uh, so the NESC published uh, TG20 back in 2005 and then revised it in 2008, uh, very much in the style of, of BS5973 to bring that practical guidance back in um, and really ease the transition to moving to the Eurocodes. Um, and then uh, we joined with the NSC um, back in uh, 2013 uh, to release TG 2013. Um, and uh, what we really sought to do then um, was uh, to write a um, much more inclusive practical guide uh, for the whole scaffolding industry. So to really broaden the, um, uh, the scope, not just to designers, uh, and also try to eliminate the need for bespoke scaffolding design on, on most typical projects, which is something I'll talk about uh, in a minute. So uh, TG20 is, um, it's two things really. Um, it's a guide to good practice uh, for tube and fitting scaffolding. Um, and it's really aimed at anybody who's involved in, in the scaffolding industry or in the construction industry um, who use scaffolding. Um, but it also includes definitions of TG20 compliant scaffolding. Um, and these definitions are standard configurations of scaffolding, uh, which are calculated by design. Uh, they're recognized by the HSC. Um, and they're designed to the Eurocode, uh, BSEN 12811. And this all comes back to um, this paragraph from the work at height regulations. Um, and what it says is that strength and stability calculations are required for scaffolding, unless that scaffolding is assembled in conformity with a, a generally recognized standard configuration. And that's what TG20 provides. Um, so essentially, if you are erecting your scaffolding to uh, TG20 to a TG20 compliant scaffold, then these strength and stability calculations have been done for you and you don't need to uh, get a bespoke design um, performed for your scaffold. So really TG20, as well as providing good practice guidance, really uh, seeks to um, uh, help to make it as easy as possible to um, provide scaffolds for standard situations. And uh, TG20 is comprised of a few parts. Uh, the first one is the operational guide. And um, this is a full color guide. You'll have seen it in TG2013, uh, if you're familiar with that. Uh, we've extended it and updated it for TG2021. Um, and again, um, what the operational guide does is it um, comprises all the good practice from the, the wide range of, of sort of technical and health and safety guidance from the NASC, um, but it also uh, provides guidance which is supported by the structural research and calculations that we and the NESC performed uh, during the development of TG2013 and TG2021. Um, TG20 also has a design guide and that's the same uh, for the new edition, uh, it's been updated and then this uh, also has, um, has two jobs. Um, the first one is it provides the basis for design of the TG20 compliant scaffolds but it also provides guidance for scaffold designers for the bespoke design of special scaffolds that are outside the scope of TG20. And then we also have a user guide. Uh, it's a little pocket guide uh, for site operatives. Uh, and the aim is it, um, it sort of summarizes the principal points from the operational guide. Uh, again, this has been uh, significantly updated for TG2021. And 
And then um, the next part are the TG20 compliance sheets. Um, so essentially, TG20 has a, a wide range of scaffolds that are, are compliant and therefore designed by calculation. So you need some method of showing whether your scaffold is compliant or not uh, without having to uh, sort of read through the whole operational guide and, and demonstrate it. So that's what the TG20 compliance sheets do. And they summarize the principal design criteria that your scaffold must meet in order to be compliant with that uh, TG20 compliance sheet. And you'll see later, we've significantly updated these uh, for TG2021. Um, we ne they're now double-sided uh, and they have a, a sort of illustration of the scaffold on the first page, a much clearer compliance criteria, but then with all the details on the back page. I'll show you that soon. Okay, um, so this is a sample uh, compliance sheet. Um, so this is the front page. You can now see that you have an illustration of the scaffold. Um, it's just a typical uh, representative elevation of the scaffold. Um, and you can see it shows uh, the principal criteria, for example, the number of lifts, how many are boarded. You can see there's a bridge there. You can see the tie positions, which are marked with those crosses. And um, running along the bottom now, uh, we have what we call TG20 compliance badges. And these um, highlight the principal criteria for the scaffold. Um, so on the left, you have the wind factor, which shows uh, the, the wind exposure for the site. Um, the, uh, the compliance badges with the white background are the principal dimensions and loading. So the maximum height of the scaffold, the number of boarded lifts, the maximum uh, lift height and bay length, the maximum width of the scaffold in boards and inside boards, and the maximum loading. And then those colored boxes show you the, um, the tie duty for the scaffold and the maximum leg load. And then you can see along the right hand side, um, you have the uh, sign off sheet or sign off part of the sheet, uh, which shows you the contract details and the scaffold details, who prepared the compliance sheet, and if your site procedures require it, who checked it. And you can also put your company logo down at the bottom. And on the back page of the sheet, this is largely what we had in TG 2013. It's a sort of tick list um, that shows you all of the, um, the detailed compliance criteria for the scaffold. And these also give you extra information about the, um, the, the compliance badges at the bottom. So for example, uh, the badge at the bottom shows you that maximum loading is two kilonewtons per meter squared, but in the detailed compliance criteria, it will tell you the maximum number of lifts that can be loaded to that. So it's very important to read uh, both sides uh, together. And then because this particular scaffold had a bridge, uh, just like in TG 2013, you get further pages on the compliance sheet uh, that give you details about all the additional features uh, that you may need. So for example, um, this additional page gives you the specification uh, for the bridge, uh, the, max, um, the maximum dimensions, the beam specification, and the lacing and bracing diagram. So very similar to TG 2013. Now, to generate the TG20 compliance sheets, we provide a TG20 e-guide. So this is very similar to TG2013 again, but we've substantially uh, extended it and uh, redeveloped it for TG2021. Um, so it's now available online, and I'll show you that soon, uh, in something that we call the NASC e-portal. And the e-portal is going to be the home of the electronic guidance for the NASC. So we're starting with TG20, but the plan is to extend it in the future with further guidance. And the ePortal is accessible through a web browser uh, and it works on Windows or a Mac and also on an iPhone, iPad or Android device. And in addition to the e-guide, the ePortal provides electronic versions of the operational guide and design guide for the first time, whereas previously in TG2013 they were only available um, as printed books. I've got a few um, screenshots of the ePortal and the eGuide so you can see how they look, but I'll show you a live uh, demonstration in a minute too. Um, so this just really shows you that um, uh, you uh, log into the ePortal with a username and password. Um, so you can use the same username and password on, on different devices at home or uh, out on site. Um, this is showing you the three parts that are in the ePortal at the moment, the TG20 eGuide, the Operational Guide and the Design Guide. For the operational guide, it's very much like an online version of the, the printed book. Uh, so you can uh, page through, or you can uh, read the table of contents, or you can search. Uh, it's also hyperlinked, so you can uh, jump about between the chapters. And similarly for the design guide, but the design guide is very much in the, in the style of the, uh, the book. 
And the e-guide, as I'll show you soon, um, very similar to the TG2013 e-guide when you first start for selecting the, the type of scaffold. But as you move on, it has a new uh, kind of friendly look to it where as you uh, choose the options that you want for your TG20 compliance sheet, you see the scaffold build up in front of you. So it just makes it very clear what you're choosing. As to what's new in TG2021, um, we've extended the range of TG20 compliance scaffolds uh, to cover some more typical cases. Um, so the first one is we now have TG20 compliance sheets for tied independent scaffolds with up to three inside boards. Uh, we also now have compliance sheets for external bird cages, whereas in TG2013 only internal bird cages were compliant. Uh, we've added definitions for typical tube and fitting mobile towers um, we've also changed the loading bays uh, quite substantially. Um, in TG2013, the loading bays were five boards wide, uh, but we heard from a lot of people that that was uh, a little too narrow for operating the gate. Um, so we've modified those now so that they're now six boards wide uh, with, with two inside boards between the loading bay and the uh, main scaffold. Or um, they can be up to 10 boards wide over three bays. And in addition to that, uh, we now have some compliance sheets for loading bays without beams, um, with a reduced base spacing. Um, finally, the TG20 compliance sheets uh, also now provide details for part boarded scaffolds. Um, these were covered in TG2013, but conservatively, um, so the compliance sheet would always show you, for example, the leg load for a fully boarded scaffold. Um, so we've improved that. Um, and also, just to let you know, there have been some changes to the, the maximum heights, the leg loads and the tie duties uh, reported by the TG2021 compliance sheets. Um, these are largely been done um, just to make it easier for um, a temporary works engineer, for example, to, to manually check the results from a TG20 compliance sheet. Um, whereas previously in TG2013, a lot of the results uh, required quite a complicated uh, structural analysis to, to prove. Um, so we've simplified it uh, quite a lot for some of the, the taller scaffolds in particular. Um, we've been really pleased to have support from uh, the HSC, who very uh, kindly provided us with a, with a forward for TG2021. And then also, we've been very pleased uh, that Build UK uh, provided us with a, a forward as well. So that's the background, uh, and I'll just show you um, what the NAC ePortal and TG2021 look like. So I'm just going to switch across. Hopefully you can see that okay. Um, so you can see that the ePortal is accessed through a web browser. Um, if you just scroll down, you can see some information about what the ePortal is and what's new in TG20. A little bit about compliance sheets and the industry support. Um, you will also see that if you're a user of the TG2013 eGuide, there's a free subscription period, which is running until the 12th of July, where you can sign up with your TG2013 serial number. And then it also gives information about how to subscribe to the to the ePortal uh, with different prices for NASC members or non-members. And uh, there's also um, discounts uh, if you want to subscribe for more than one year. If I head back to the top and log in. Um, so this is the, um, the home screen for TG 2021. If I just show you the operational guide and design guide first, and then I'll show you the e-guide. So the operational guide um, starts with the foreword. And you can just page through, just as with a book, uh, through each page. And these um, pages adapt to your screen size. So for example, if you have a tablet or a mobile phone, then they will shrink to fit. And you can also search, uh, and as I say, you can uh, move between the, the pages. If you want to see what's new, if you go right to the end, to the appendix, there's also a section that shows all the, the changes from TG2013 uh, with the links to the relevant pages. Similarly for the design guide, uh, very similar, but much more in the style of um, uh, the, uh, the design guide, with the, the drawn illustrations and so on. And again, just as with um, the operational guide, if you go right down to the end, there's an index of changes so with, uh, with links to all the changed figures, tables, and clauses. 
Now for the e-guide, um, um, so this allows you to uh, generate strategic 20 compliance sheet. And the first step is to, to choose the type of scaffold that's required. So just as with the TG2013 e-guide, we have all the range of TG2013, uh, sorry, the TG20 compliance scaffolds, but this has been extended to include the external birdcage. Uh, the independent scaffold has, has been extended to uh, support three inside boards. Uh, we have the option for the mobile tower. And then for the loading bays, if you choose the independent scaffold, you get the chance to add a loading bay as you go along. So I'll show you an independent scaffold. So the first step is to choose the site location. And if you have a device with a GPS, it will automatically select where you are. But you can search by an address, a postcode, or a business name. So let's say I'll choose the NASC office. And behind the scenes, this will automatically calculate the wind exposure for the site. And this is um, used to determine the, the safe height, the tie duty, and the leg loads for your scaffold. Now, the rest of the screens are very much like the TG2013 guide. And the idea is that you select your compliance sheet, answering one question at a time. But this time, um, you see the representation of the scaffold building up in front of you as you answer each question. So the first one, you can choose whether to have a traditional two meter lifts or uh, floor level lifts up to three meters. Let's just say I stay with two meter lifts for now. You can uh, enter the scaffold dimensions. So for example, you can make the scaffold longer and you can see the illustration update and the same if you make it taller. And you can see that the bracing patterns and the, the tie pattern update as we uh, change the scaffold dimensions. Now this is a new option for TG2021. You can now choose how many lifts are boarded. You can choose the standard configuration of fully boarded or the top two lifts. You can add ladder landings or you can choose a different number of boarding lifts. And this makes a big difference to the leg load. Let's say, uh, let's say the top two lifts are boarded with ladder landings. As for TG2013, you can choose the duty of the scaffold uh, and this affects the, uh, the maximum loading. Uh, let's say I'll make it a general purpose scaffold. And we can choose the platform width in main boards and inside boards. Let's say I'll go up to three inside boards now. We can choose whether to apply any cladding, which can be brick guards, debris netting or sheeting. Um, try some debris netting. And then just as with TG2013, you can choose whether to use traditional tube and fitting um, transoms, or you can use um, prefabricated structural uh, transoms or ready lock style transoms. And the e-guide, just as with TG2013, will advise whether you can emit the ledger bracing in that condition. But I'll just stick with tube and fitting transoms for now. Uh, just as with TG2013, you have the option for um, traditional type 4 steel tubes or TG20 compliant uh, 3 point mil high tensile steel. Uh, I'll just stick with type 4. And you can also choose whether to apply um, any sort of additional features to your scaffold. So you can add a pavement lift. Let's say we add a cantilever fan. And this time, the representation updates as you add the features so you can see how they'll look. If I choose next, because I chose those options, I get a few extra questions. Um, how to stabilize the uh, pavement lift and which lift I want the cantilever fan on so I can move that up and down. Um, I can also add a bridge similar to TG2013, uh, but now you can see the bridge positioned on the illustration. And I can also choose whether to add a, an inner platform uh, with hop-up brackets. I'll skip that for this case. Um, this is where you can add your uh, ladder access tower if you want an external tower or the loading bay. Um, if you do choose the loading bay, I will put one on for now because there's quite a lot going on already. Um, but if you do, you also have these options now about the width of the loading bay, um, whether it's two or three bays wide and whether or not it's supported by beams. As I say, I'll just skip back and keep it a little simpler for now. So if I choose next, then what the e-guide has done there is it's checked whether the scaffold is compliant, and it is, and it's also worked out which of the TG20 tie patterns are applicable. 
And you can see that you have um, all six of the available tie patterns uh, are applicable to this scaffold. So we can choose whether to tie every lift or alternate lifts. And we also have the choice uh, whether to provide half the number of ties at double the duty. So let's just say I skip that and choose tie pattern A. So the final step is we get a, a preview of the illustration for the compliance sheet. And you can see that it's a sort of first angle projection with the, um, the elevation, the plan, and the, um, the section of the uh, scaffold. You can see we have the TG20 compliance uh, badges along the bottom with the uh, calculated win factor for the site and the tie duty that's required and the maximum leg load. And um, because we applied a bridge, actually, uh, you also get these arrows. If you pick one of these arrows, you also get a little cutaway of the bridge. Um, and you can see that it's calculated a different leg load for the bridge because obviously it's supporting the load from above the bridge. Um, and you can also see that it's worked out you need double standards at the bridge as well. And then finally, before we produce the compliance sheet, we can just fill in the contract details. So the contract number and the client. We can put in a reference number for the scaffold. We can sign off with a signature. And if you're on a device, you can, you can sign directly on the screen or you can pick an image. I've already got one. Um, you can provide some notes. And then again, if you, um, if you require it, uh, you can provide a, a checker. So somebody who's looked over the compliance sheet and confirmed that it matches the uh, scaffold that it relates to. And in that case, you can provide the, the name and details of the person who's checked it. Uh, you can upload your company logo. And then finally, you just save the compliance sheet as a PDF. And then that will download to your computer or device. And here it comes. So you can see the first page is the illustration of the scaffold uh, with the bridge and the fan, the pavement lift, the sheeting, um, the, the tie positions. Uh, you get the detailed compliance criteria for the scaffold. So this is what you have to check to make sure your scaffold will uh, conform to the compliance sheet. And then because we selected some additional features, you can see them ticked on here. Uh, the pavement lift, the cantilever, the fan, and the three bay bridge. So we also provide additional sheets for those additional features. So you get the illustration of the bridge with the additional leg load for the supporting standards and the double standards of the bridge. You get all the lacing and bracing uh, details for the uh, beams and the beam specification. You get another page for the uh, pavement lift. And then also finally another page for the fan. Um, so that's how the new league guide works and the new TG2021 compliant, uh, compliant sheets. And just very quickly, I won't run you through all of them, um, but I'll just show you the birdcage. Uh, it's very, very similar. Again, you get a preview of the uh, scaffold as it builds up uh, for the birdcage. It's a representa uh, representational cube. Um, you can select the, um, the duty of the scaffold, which affects the uh, bay length and the bay spacing. So I make it light duty. You can choose the scaffold height, which can go anything up to 10 and a half meters. You can specify how it's stabilized. So again, you could specify it's tied in one or both directions, butted in one or both directions, or freestanding. So let's say I make it tied in one direction, and then you can choose which direction is tied and which direction is freestanding. You can also change the dimensions of the scaffold. And also new, for the new e-guide, you can choose how many lifts are boarded. So the top one, the top two, you can apply perimeter boarding or you can fully board the birdcage. Um, let's just say I'll just make it perimeter boarded just for illustration. And then you can see the illustration update and you can choose the width of the perimeter boards. Um, just as with the other scaffold types, you can choose the uh, type of steel to use. I'll just stick with type four. And then you get your compliance summary. So you can see, um, again, you get the plan, uh, the section and the elevation. Um, you can see because it's tied in one direction, you can see the tie positions. And this scaffold needs to be tied along the top lift. Um, some of the external bird cages require ties at alternate lifts or every lift. And you can also see, actually, because it's tied in one direction and freestanding in the other, um, the freestanding direction requires um, continuous bracing to the top of the bird cage, whereas the tie direction, you can use um, single bay bracing if you wish. And along the bottom, you get a, a warning that this is an internal bird cage only. You get the dimensions. And because it has a freestanding direction, um, it, it tells you the maximum freestanding height to base ratio that you must maintain, uh, even during erection and dismantling. 
it gives you the tie duty and the maximum leg load. And again, we can just fill in the, um, the sign off details. You can provide your company Lego if you wish. Let's start. Will the calculations be available for review for design scaffolds? Um, if I understand this correctly, um, one thing we decided not to do for the ePortable is produce any printed calculations um, because we wanted it to be clear um, that anybody who's uh, competent in uh, the use of scaffolding is able to use the ePortal and produce a compliance sheet uh, just by answering simple questions about the, uh, the layout and the loading and the, the purpose of the scaffold. Uh, so we wanted to be very careful um, to sort of leave out anything that was specifically for designers from the e-guide. Um, from, uh, with, my, with my CADS hat uh, on, uh, we have some uh, software in, in the Smart Scaffolder range uh, called Smart Calculations. Uh, and this produces printed calculation sheets that are compatible with the uh, TG20 compliant um, scaffolds. So for example, if you want to work out how the wind factor was calculated for your site, uh, this additional piece of software will produce a calculation sheet that justifies the wind factor. And it also does the same um, for the leg loads, the tie duties and the uh, beams. So it's, it's quite a good cost check uh, if you want to find out how the calculation was done. Um, then it's, uh, that's, a, that's a good method, for example, that uh, a temporary works engineer can cross check a compliance sheet that's been provided by a scaffolding contractor, for example. Great stuff, thank you. Next question. Can the lacing and bracing diagram be printed out separately? Um, no, it's, 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 uh, it's printed out with the compliance sheet, uh, but we do have the lacing and bracing diagrams in the operational guide. Um, so potentially you could uh, sort of take a screenshot of that and, and print that out um, if, if that helps. Thank you very much. How much of the electronic parts require an active internet connection? Can any of it be used offline? Um, no, actually the whole thing is online now. Uh, it's one of the things that allows us to, to run it on any device, for example. Um, so you do need at least, um, it, it does work on a 3G internet connection, uh, but Wi-Fi or 4G would be, would be best. Fantastic. I've been very impressed with the new e-guide and the e-portal. Will you be adding the TG and SG guidance sheets? TBT would also be a good addition. Um, that is the intention, actually, yes. So, oh, thank you, by the way. <laughs> That's very nice of you to say. Um, yeah, the, um, the intention is that we, would, that we will add the uh, other NESC guidance. Um, I think that's going to be our next step. Um, we've also got a, quite a few ideas uh, with the NESC about uh, what additional apps and guidance that we can add. So um, we'll kind of keep you posted about those as they, um, as, as they come about. But yes, the, the TG20 is just the first. Great. Uh, next one's more of a comment than a question. It's great to see a section included for the site management team to accept and sign. Really important for temporary works management. Oh, that's great. Yes, and in fact, that idea really came from uh, temporary works engineers. Um, so we're very uh, thankful for that. Thank you. Great. In the calculation of the wind loading, is the probability factor, brackets 0 0.7 or 0 0.83 squared, included as a default, or is there any option to apply it or not? Yes, good question. Uh, yes, that is applied. Um, again, this is one of the things that we discussed, whether to provide any um, flexibility for longer, uh, longer standing scaffold structures, but we decided, at least for now, just to keep it simple uh, and avoid that. Again, quick plug for the Smart Scaffolder software. If you use the, um, the wind calculation software there, which is basically a, the, you know, the version of the eGuide wind map that produces the calculation, you can change the probability factor there. Um, so you can recalculate your wind factor if you, if you had a a longer standing scaffold. Next question, will compliance sheets be accepted by clients like Highways England or Network Rail, uh, clients that have their own design compliance procedures or may require CAT3 checks to BS5975? Um, that's a good question. Um, I can't answer for everyone. Um, I know that there are some of the major contractors, for example, will take compliance sheets in, in some situations and not others. They sort of provide their own uh, kind of scope of what they will accept uh, as a TG20 compliant scaffold. Uh, so for example, a TG20 compliant scaffold can go up to 50 meters tall in some circumstances. Um, some of the contractors will say that they'll, they'll take it up to, for example, 20 meters, or maybe you need somebody to then look at it if you have a, a taller scaffold. So they, they will apply their own um, 
their own circumstances. Um, but as I say, if, um, if a client requires uh, an independent check, um, then um, that, that can be done. So an engineer could cross-check the results from a TG20 compliance sheet. And as I say, um, the smart calculation software that we produce makes that much easier uh, by making it very transparent. Um, so essentially the temporary works engineer can produce an equivalent uh, calculation sheet and then look over all of the working for that and then decide if they were, uh, if, if, if they agree with that. Brilliant, thank you. We're up to 30 unanswered questions at the moment, Terry. So um, they're coming okay, from far. <laughs> so we'll, we'll carry on cracking through them. Can you have brick guards and netting? Uh, yeah, this is a good question, actually. Um, again, this is one that we were thinking about. Um, it's, that's one of the things about putting an illustration on there. Is if, if you have brick guards and netting, then the netting case will actually cover that as far as the compliance goes. Um, but as far as the illustration goes, you won't see the brick guard. Uh, so that's, it's a fair question. So um, that might be one of the things maybe to, to put in the notes or something like that. But essentially for the cladding, you just need to choose the worst condition. Um, so if you have any sheeting, choose that one. If you have any netting, choose that one. And then brick guards uh, and then unclad. Um, it's a, it's a good question. We did think about that more for the illustration, particularly. Okay. Will we ever be able to produce a compliance sheet for a freestanding loading bay? Probably not. <laughs> I don't know, actually. Um, we're always taking requests. Uh, that's one thing. And the new scaffold types that we put in were very much uh, requests from uh, people who use TG2013. Um, we held a big consultation uh, with the NESC uh, with everyone that who'd, who'd purchased or used TG2013. I think we collected something like 450 responses um, and then we went through all of those and then they informed um, all of the new scaffold types we've added. Um, we put lots of the feedback into the operational guide and the design guide. Um, so there will always be scaffolds that are outside of the scope of TG20 because we're really just trying to catch all of the, the typical ones. There will always be the need for bespoke design. Um, but the aim will be gradually over time to, to add more TG20 compliance scaffolds. Thank you. What do you do about foundation design and checking? Um, again, this was a, a big debate. While we were writing TG2013 particularly, um, the conclusion really was that um, we're just reporting the leg loads and we really are leaving that to the uh, person responsible for the foundation design. Uh, because that's largely, it's not usually the scaffolding contractor, it's usually out of their expertise. Um, so really the guidance that we give is that we just report the maximum leg load um, um, to be used in the foundation design. Um, that's why we've really shied away from providing much guidance. Um, you know, even the design of the sole boards to a point, uh, it's, um, you, you need all the details of the, the, the ground conditions. Um, so that, that's kind of the the scope of TG20 kind of stops at the below the base plates, if you like. Does this come in an app? It's one of the things we're thinking of, actually. Um, we are aiming to uh, develop a, an iOS app and an Android app. Um, they're very much going to still run online, though. So you'll be essentially running the, the e-portal, but you know, sort of framed in an app. So you'll still need your internet connection, but that's what we are planning, just to make it a little bit easier to start up and access without having to go and, 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 and browse it in the browser. On combined leg loads, where the bridge exists, does it differentiate where lighter leg loads occur where no support exists? No, not in the e-guide. And again, this was a, a lot of uh, thought and discussion we put into this about how much detail we put in, but we really wanted to keep it as simple as possible. Um, so we just report the maximum leg load for the scaffold um, and the maximum leg load at the bridge. Again, if you want more detail, again, this isn't, it sounds like a plug, but this, this, really, this really is to keep the e-guide as simple as possible. But our, our smart scaffolder uh, calculation software will show you the leg load at each standard. So even if you have significantly leg loads, different leg loads on the inner and outer standards of the bridge, it will report that. And also if you have significantly different leg loads along the length of the scaffold, for example, if you have boarded, um, uh, border sections and unboarded sections where you have ladder landings, it will pick that up for you. But we really wanted to exclude that from the e-guide so that there was no chance of error. What is the height limit stated in the 2021 version? Um, ooh, the height limit, uh, it depends on the scaffold type. Um, it's calculated. Uh, it's calculated based on the, uh, the dimensions that you put in, the additional features you've asked for, and the, uh, the wind factor. 
there's an absolute limit of 50 meters. Um, you know, you see, even if you put it, even if you end up with double standards and a, and a very, uh, very narrow bay length and so on, with, there's a limit on that. Um, some of the other scaffolds have uh, lower limits, so the bird cage is 10 and a half meters. Uh, the loading bay with beams has been um, capped at uh, 20 meters height uh, in, in the new guidance, just for practical reasons. The loading bay without beams, um, the maximum is 12 to 14 meters, depending on, on what you choose. And obviously, some of the freestanding towers are, are lower. Um, but they're all, they're all designed by calculation, so it really depends on, on which options you choose. Okay, thank you. There's a question here uh, that's training related. When will TG2021 be included in scaffold inspection training? I don't think oh. <laughs> I'm not sure, but I am, I am going to be meeting, uh, doing a presentation to um, the scaffold training providers soon. So I suppose the answer will be soon. Yeah, I think on that one, um, we will we'll send a note round. I think that's not a question for Terry today. So uh, we'll get an answer to you and uh, we'll put that in the video. So thank you for that one. Uh, next question, do we still have standard compliance sheets? Um, well, just checking what you mean, but in the TG2013 uh, operational guide, we did have a few standard compliance sheets for typical scaffolds, for example, 16 meter independent scaffolds. Um, if that's what you're asking, we, we've actually taken those out um, just because, particularly because we've, we've provided more options with the three inside boards, it was just starting to get a little bit complicated. Um, and particularly because it's quite easy to produce a compliance sheet now. Um, when we wrote TG2013, um, we were very much wanted the operational guide to be used standalone. Uh, for example, even if you couldn't use the e-guide or you didn't, you, you didn't have access to, um, to the technology, but that doesn't seem to be such an issue now. So we've, uh, we've, we've just gone for producing compliance sheets from the um, e-guide. The other thing is a lot of feedback we've had is um, people very much wanted the compliance sheet to be specific to the site. So they didn't really like the idea of the, of the standard compliance sheet. Thank you. Uh, have NASC considered whether they could develop TG20 to be more user-friendly for house builders? Oh, um, yeah, yes. The answer is yes. <laughs> so again, it's one of those things uh, that's going to be on the list. Uh, yeah, that's very much for sort of freestanding, freestanding independent scaffolds. But yeah, we do appreciate that that's um, not really in the scope of TG20 at the moment. But yes, we do, we do have a kind of a list of requests and that, that is certainly on there. In civil engineering, often tie position on the compliance sheet are unable to be met. Does this invalidate the design and an original design is then needed? That's a really good question. Um, we've put a bit more guidance about this in the operational guide but because um, there's always sort of pluses and minuses with doing something like adding an illustration. So because we've added an illustration, we now show the tie positions, which makes it much clearer. But then suddenly, if you can't meet that very idealised tie pattern on site, then you're going to come up against this. So we've tried to clarify in the operational guide um, that the tie positions that we show on the illustration are very much idealised and you might need to move them uh, or sort of reposition them um, based on site conditions. And we provide some guidance in the operational guide for doing that. We've extended it as well, actually, um, for example, uh, to provide guidance where the tie position needs to be more than 300 millimetres from the node and that sort of thing. Um, so yes, if you do run up against that on site, then uh, please look at chapter seven of the operational guide and there's some guidance in there. Thank you. What if we need to build an independent scaffold longer than the dimensions permitted on the compliance sheet? Yeah, that's a good question again. Um, actually, the length of the scaffold um, isn't really one of the compliance criteria. Again, this is one of the sort of slightly odd things about putting an illustration on the compliance sheet because we're just showing a representative illustration. So for practical reasons, we've limited it to 20 meters in the, in the e guide. Um, but actually you can uh, build a longer one if you want to. Uh, essentially the, the design is modular because it's tied and because it's, it's uh, braced at a certain frequency, you can build it longer than it shows on the illustration. Uh, obviously the height is a different, a different matter. Other than the small picture showing the double leg required for a bridge, is it emphasized anywhere else, e.g. in the body of the dock wording? Uh, yes, yes, it's also in the detailed compliance criteria. Um, so again, in TG2013, all you had was that essentially the bullet points of compliance criteria. So now we try to highlight the, the main points, but you still need to read the, uh, uh, the bullet points on the back for, for sure. When choosing other on lifts of boards on an independent scaffold, can you choose which lifts will need to be boarded or does it default from the top down? 
Mm, it defaults to top down. Uh, again, this is one of the discussions we had because we were we have a sort of fine line really with the e-guide that we want to make it as easy as possible to choose a compliance sheet without wandering into producing a, a sort of complicated drawing. Um, so again, again, I'm not, not really plugging our software, but we, we have some we have some software called Smart Scaffold which you can use uh, where you can do a much more uh, sort of detailed layout of the scaffold. Uh, uh, for example, if you want to choose which lifts are boarded, if they have different heights, if you have a step or slope in the elevation or the ground level, and we really wanted to stay away from that for the e-guide um, because it's not really necessary for uh, illustrating the design criteria. Um, so, uh, as I say, we, we did shy away from choosing which lifts were boarded. On the TG20 compliance software where the fan was fitted, it showed spurs going down to the fan and also upwards, but on the side view it only showed upward spurs. Would this be confusing to any clients? Um, I'm not sure really, but the main thing is, and we do emphasise this in the text as well, in the text of the operational guide and also on the compliance sheet. Um, the ideal situation is the, the fan is supported by uh, sort of prop tubes from below, um, but where necessary, you may need to use um, uh, tubes supported from above. Um, either is fine from the structural point of view, but obviously if the tubes are above, uh, then there's the, the chance of an object may bounce off the tube rather than being caught by the fan. Um, the reason why we show it uh, above in the illustration is because I also had a bridge at the same lift, then it, it wasn't possible to um, put the tubes below at the bridge standards. So essentially the tubes, are, the fan is supported from below wherever possible and just on the section above the bridge, the, um, the tubes are shown above. Um, but there's some, some clear text in the operational guides and the back of the compliance sheet uh, to, to explain that. But again, we have we have the same thought. Is this system available for use on a greenfield site? Um, I s well, I'm not exactly sure what you mean, um, but you would need an internet connection, I suppose, to use it. And uh, again, I suppose it depends on on the types of scaffold that you're that you're using, whether whether it would apply. Again, a freestanding scaffold, to not really. Uh, other, other than a sort of range of um, independent scaffolds supported by uh, rakers and, uh, and butting transoms, uh, completely freestanding scaffolds are outside the scope of TG20 at the moment. Thank you. What happens about PI with the new e-guide? Um, oh, that's, that's a good question. It's very much the same as the, as the previous one, I suppose. Um, yeah, there is, a, there is a note about this in the operational guide, particularly um, that uh, what we're trying to do with the operational guide, the design guide and the e-guide is, is produce helpful information, really. And um, so the important thing is that, is that you um, interpret the information uh, for, your, for your situations. And um, if you have any doubts, uh, then please contact, uh, you know, please uh, contact us if you have any questions or please contact a designer if you have any questions about whether the um, information that we provide in the guide is applicable for your site. Uh, as a client, when will the full system be live and when will we scaffold contractors have to implement the changes? Ooh, um, I'm not sure. There's, there's going to be um, a transition period uh, for three months until July um, where we're um, sort of showing it and getting people getting people logged in and, and that sort of thing, getting everyone up and running. Um, and the idea is after that transition period, uh, we're also going to produce printed versions of the operational design guide. I suppose at that point it will all be live. Um, there will also be uh, a sort of transition period where uh, TG2021 and TG2013 are operating in, in parallel um, because obviously TG2013 is, is still valid and if you have an existing site, you wouldn't need to jump across uh, straight away. I'm not sure what that period's going to be. Um, that's something the NAC will announce. Um, uh, over a matter of time, uh, but there will be announcements and also the TG2013 e-guide itself will, will kind of announce these things um, as, as we go along. So you may have seen, for example, if, you, if you're using the TG2013 e-guide at the moment, it's got a little announcement in there that the e-portal is live and we'll be updating that announcement as, um, as more information comes along about, um, about the rollout. If you use a standard solution, are you then considered the designer CDM 2015, and should you have some form of scaffolding qualification to use the portal? 
Uh, it's, a, oh, it's a very good question. This is the age-old question, isn't it, really? Because, uh, yes, even if you put up a scaffold um, without a design, if you build that scaffold yourself in effect, you, you're, you're the designer. So you haven't done any design calculations, but you've made the decisions about where those tubes go, where the bracing goes, and so on. So you've done that. Um, if you're essentially the e-guide is producing standard uh, the, the compliance sheets are essentially standard designs that you are choosing from. So then uh, to a point, if you're, if you're choosing one of those standard designs, then you are making a design decision, yes, that that standard design is applicable for your scaffold. Um, to do that, you would need to be, uh, you'd need to be a, a sort of competent scaffolder is the, is the idea. So you wouldn't necessarily have to be able to, we certainly wouldn't have to be able to do the analysis calculations, for example, to choose that uh, uh, a compliance sheet is applicable for your scaffold, but you certainly would have to understand the contents of the operational guide, uh, for example. Um, uh, yeah, you, you need to be competent as a, as a scaffolder is the idea. And that's very much why the, um, uh, the checker signature is on the compliance sheet as well, uh, because then you do get the opportunity for somebody to cross-check what you've done and check that it is apl applicable to that scaffold. And as I say, depending on your organisation, that could be another competent uh, uh, scaffolding contractor or you know, no competent scaffolder or it could be an independent check by a uh, temporary works engineer for example. Will it give leg loadings for contractor to provide base conditions? Mm, yes, yes that's it. The, uh, the leg load that it reports is the maximum leg load um, including all the horizontal loading effects as well um, so uh, and that is intended for the, uh, the foundation design uh, specifically. Um, it's actually, it's one of the things that came up in PG 2013, the leg load that's reported is not necessarily the, the critical leg load for the uh, scaffold uh, design, it's very much the, uh, the maximum leg load, including all of the horizontal loading for the foundations. Okay, another comment more than a question. Uh, temporary works industry is moving away from probability of 0 0.7, industry is moving towards 0 0.9 squared. Yes, uh, as soon as that happens, we will update the uh, ePortal. Um, and that, that's one of the advantages of it being online as well. Uh, if we ever need to update anything, we can, we can do it straight away. And we don't have to rely on people installing software and then maybe using the older one. Yeah, we are aware of that, but we've, um, we've stuck with uh, what's in 5975, uh, essentially, for now. Why does the birdcage height max out at 10.5 metres? Yeah, it's a fair question. Um, it's a bit of an arbitrary limit on the on the internal birdcage. The, the external birdcage, um, the maximum height may be less depending on the wind exposure and the um, um, uh, and the method of stabilisation. But yes, the internal birdcage is, is sort of uh, the, again the, the the aim is really just for the typical scaffolds. So the the thought always is that if we, if we think that it would be better for a, for a taller scaffold to be looked at by a design engineer, we. we uh, we sort of cap things with the NASC. Great. Can the software be transferred from one device to another or is it just limited once installed to that device? Well that's again it's another big advantage of this one because it's online um, you can just use it from any device uh, and you can use your, you can use the same login um, so you can you can use it from home or your office or, or, or out on site. Uh, the only limitation is that uh, each login can only be used on one device at a time um, so if you're, if somebody else is using your login uh, on another device and you try to log in, it will, it will warn you and tell you that it's in use and give you the option to uh, actually kick them out and, uh, and, and take it over. But that's really useful because it means if you leave your computer on in the office and then you come home, you, you don't need to remember to log out. It's, it's very, it's very flexible actually. Are there any plans to put system scaffolds on a similar system as per the manufacturer's manual? Hmm, it's a very good, yeah, it's a very good question and it's very much in discussion. Uh, it would have to be something that we would do in conjunction with the manufacturers uh, for sure and it would be quite a big, quite a big deal really, but um, yes, it's, 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 um, it's very much sort of coming to everyone's attention that because the compliance sheet sort of provides, um, it, it provides scaffold heights and leg loads and tie duties by calculation, then in principle you should have the same kind of information for a system scaffold. Uh, some manufacturers will produce this uh, and some others um, don't at the moment. Um, so it's one of the things that we're discussing is whether we can provide a, a sort of standard method for doing it very much in the, in the TG20 style, um, but uh, early days at the moment. Okay. Uh, is it possible in the future to add Middle East wind exposure? Yeah, we've, this is what we're thinking really. Um, at the moment, uh, we support um, uh, the UK and Ireland. Um, uh, and the Channel Islands, um, but the, the aim is uh, to provide uh, more and more 
uh, more and more um, uh, country support uh, for those those countries who publish um, wind speeds that are compatible with uh, with the Eurocodes. Um, so yes, that is something that we're planning to do. Does the programme prevent printing of blank sheets to prevent some unprofessional scaffolders giving clients <laughs> compliance sheets that have not been correctly calculated? Oh, I've never heard of such a thing. Um, but um, it, it's a little bit tricky because because ultimately um, we're producing a PDF document, and if you want to, you, you know there, there are editors available for those PDF documents and so on. It's it's quite difficult, but um, we we try to uh, prevent it as much as possible. Let's put it like that. So, for example, that the PDFs can't be edited um, um, by default unless you unless you try really hard to get around the protection. And um, certainly, by using the e guide, you can't produce a blank compliance sheet. You you must enter a site address, and that site address is reported on the on the compliance sheet. Am I correct in thinking there is still no compliant data for an end ledger cantilever extension? Yeah, that's right, but that's very much on the wish list. In fact, I would say it's quite near the top of the wish list. Um, so it's, this is one of these things where um, we're working uh, again with the NESC to work out what to do in, in, in what sequence in the e portal, really, uh, whether it's to provide. Uh, you know, the additional um, CG and SG guidance and the CD guidance and so on, uh, whether it's to provide new apps. Um, um, uh, for other uh, technical or safety guidance or whether to extend the e-guide. Um, so yeah, we, we've got quite a long list of, of things that we'd love to do. Um, that, is, that is a very popular one. Thank you. Can the loading bays be done in floor level lifts and boarded on all levels? Um, not exactly. If, you, if your scaffold is to floor level lifts, then the e-guide will automatically put in structural lifts for the loading bay uh, because the loading bay is limited to two meters. So you can actually produce a compliance sheet for a loading bay that's for a scaffold with floor level lifts. Um, but the TG20 compliant loading bays are limited to top lift boarded only. Okay. Will the design guide and operational guidebooks be available in a downloadable electronic format? Um, that's not the plan at the moment. Um, so at the moment, the aim is that you can read line uh, or you can have the printed books. Um, whether we do a, a sort of downloadable PDF, um, we're not planning to at the moment, but that's something we, I'm sure we'll review. Hi there, very impressed with the new e-guide. However, used last week and wanted to show four metre long tower, four metre high supported with outriggers, but showed anchors had to be, had to be used. Once I extended length to at least five metres, it became compliant. Um, if you and there's a couple of things. If you've got any specific questions about why it's not producing something you're not sure about, um, if you contact our, we have a technical support team and the, the details are on the e-portal. Uh, most of the questions are there for me anyway, but um, anyway, if you, if you uh, send your questions there uh, and I'll do your best to answer them. Um, one of the things is the um, compliance sheet illustration will always show the tie positions. Um, if the scaffold will permit rakers, for example, instead of ties, um, that's stated in the text of the compliance sheet on the back. Um, and then essentially you can, you can substitute the, uh, the ties for rakers at the first, the first tie position. It's a similar thing with returns, for example. Um, again, we wanted to limit the number of drawing options we put into the e-guide uh, to keep it as simple as possible. So again, um, you can substitute the, um, the tie positions at the end of the scaffold for returns if you follow the guidance in the operational guide. Um, so please just bear that in mind. Um, if you produce a compliance sheet um, and uh, someone says that it must be tied rather than rakers, it will tell you on reverse if, if rakers can be used. Will you bring anything out covering alley materials? Oh, it's another good question. That is also on, that's very much on the list. Um, so perhaps, yes, depending, depending on what order we decided, uh, that, that, well, really that the NASC decides to do things in, um, that, that is very much on the list. Would you be looking at adding hacky universal stair access to the e-guide? Yeah, that's another another thing we've been discussing because um, when it comes to system scaffolds, there's one there's there's one thing to provide compliant sheets for independent scaffolds and bird cages and so on to to, to each of the systems, but where there are common um, stair units uh, or even system loading bays and that kind of thing, um, there's also been a lot of discussion about whether we can put those into the e-guide as well to clarify things. Um, all we've done at the moment. Um, because again, we'd very much have to contact the manufacturers and we'd have to have a level playing field and that sort of thing when it comes to the e-guide. Um, but we have put much clearer guidance in the operational guide in the access and egress chapter about how you do use um, 
system staircases, for example, with a, a TG20 compliant scaffold, because it is permitted. Um, you just need some information from the manufacturer really for the, um, uh, for the staircase itself. Does the updated legislation guidance include Ireland, Republic of Ireland, and the Health and Safety Authority HSA requirements? Uh, that's a good question. It does, it does include Ireland um, and it does include, well, let's just say the calculations are, are valid for Ireland because they are, are to the Euro codes, uh, to 12811, uh, to 1991 and, and all the other applicable codes. Um, I think that's probably fair to say. Uh, I think where I'm just thinking through the operational guide, as far as I'm aware, uh, it, would, it would meet the, uh, it would meet the uh, guidance for Southern Ireland as well, yes. If you have any specific questions, please um, please pop them through our support desk and I'll, and, I'll, um, and I'll reply. Are we going to see compliance forms for handrails? Oh, yes. Um, that is, um, so TG20 is very much about access scaffolding. Um, there's some other guidance that the uh, NASC Technical Committee are working on, uh, TG1, uh, for handrails. And the idea is that once that's complete, that will go into the e-portal. Um, and we're also hoping that we can uh, produce uh, provide the guidance for that as an electronic document, uh, but also produce an app in the style of the e-guide for that as well. Um, so that's, uh, yes, again, that's, that's very much on the list. Will the e-guide loading bay design provide a side-on design? Um, yes, it has a sort of side-on illustration, uh, if that helps. So, so it shows the, the, uh, the bay width, the number of bays and the ledger bracing positions. Is there scope to modify designs, such as in restricted areas, a three-leg tower with the fourth corner suspended from above, or would this be subject to bespoke design? Yeah, I think that's where bespoke design comes in. Really. So, um, but what a lot of people do with compliant sheets as well is, um, if there's just one particular area of the scaffold that needs some bespoke design, then you can just get a, a design engineer to look at that part, and then the rest of it may be, may be a standard scaffold. Do we have any chance to import 3D model scaffolding from Autodesk Revit to TG20? Uh, no, because again, we're trying to keep it as simple as we can, but that's really, again, the plug for our smart scaffolding software. That's where we're going with that. Um, so um, we have some um, estimating software that, for example, you can bring in uh, 3D models through IFC, or you can bring in drawings through DXF or PDF. We also have a Revit plugin. Uh, which has been uh, launched quite recently as well for tube and fitting scaffolding. It's, it's fairly early days with that, but that's where we're heading. But we really want the e-guide to be, um, again, used by anybody who's competent in scaffolding to select a compliant sheet uh, without, um, you know, without the complications of, of, of BIM and, and, and Revit, for example. Uh, Terry, you sound uh, like you have good structural engineering knowledge. How did you get the knowledge as a software engineer? Oh, thanks. Um, that's a good question. Um, yeah, I mean, I am a, I am a, a software engineer, um, uh, I've, but I've been working for CADS for, uh, it's, it's about 25 years now, which is quite scary thoughts. Um, so I've been working uh, with engineers uh, daily. Uh, I started work, um, the first product that I was working on was some software for um, uh, reinforced concrete beam design. I did a lot of work on our frame analysis software, A3D Max. Uh, so really, that was my background um, before I started with, uh, with, with scaffolding and, and, and smart scaffolding and TG20. So it's a good mixture, really, because, um, um, yeah, because it means um, as, a, as a company, we've got, we've got the right mixture, really, of sort of software development and, and structural engineering to sort of be able to produce something like the e -Guide. Thank you. Uh, referring back to uh, the question we had earlier on scaffolding inspection courses and whether or not TG20 will be implemented, Dave Mosley of Scissors has written in. Uh, the courses are currently being updated at the moment and will be completed in the coming weeks. So uh, just watch this space on that one, thank you. Oh, that's good. Uh, back to you, Terry. Do you include the option for attaching rubbish chutes in this e-guide? No, again, that's something else we've thought about. Um, I, again, I think that's something we, we might come back to after. I think there were a few too many variables really. So I think we, we might come back to that. So again, We've taken that slightly easy route with that one. They just said, please uh, follow manufacturer guidance. Um, but it, essentially, the, the scaffold itself will be uh, compliant. But again, you may need some local strengthening where the, where the rubber sheet is. Uh, but again, that is on the list. Okay. Uh, here's one from uh, Chris saying, comment, not question. The previous e-guide used to allow offline access, I believe. 
And due mm -hmm. to this, the wind load and topography, etc., couldn't be selected specific to the area. However, you could select a region and then one of four seasons to ascertain height of the scaffold and tie position, brackets, worst mm -hmm. case scenario. It is a shame this doesn't seem to be available going forward as some of our sites struggle with internet access. Yeah, that's true. Uh, I think we just had to we had to just choose on that one, and, and particularly because we're providing uh, all the guidance online and that kind of thing. Um, it would I think it would start to become a bit unwieldy if we were to allow it to work offline uh, as well. I do know what you mean. Um, it, yeah, as, I suppose as long as you have an internet connection somewhere where you can produce the the compliance sheet, um, it will work. Um, I think the thing is, we've also greatly improved the wind factor calculation for TG2021 as well. Um, so for example, it will also now, as well as improving the way it looks at the, um, the topography of the site, for example, it also automatically works out if you're in a town and how far in the town and so on. So it's, it's, quite, a, it's quite a good calculation. So, and also we, we wanted to remove a lot of that kind of manual method of calculating the wind factor from the operational guide. And again, not really trouble the scaffolding contractors with that and leave it more to the design guide. Um, so, but yes, I, I, I do agree. Um, it's a, it, it is a bit of a restriction that you do need internet connection now. Um, but of course, again, with e basically as long as you've got at least a 3G connection on your phone, if you can tether your phone to your computer or use it on your phone, then there are there are options. And I think not all of, a lot of that wasn't as commonplace back in, in 2012 when we were working on the, the previous e-guide. When will the operative user guides be available? Well, quite soon, I think. Um, so the, the, the new user guide has been written and it's been through the review process. Um, it's my understanding, actually, that it's going to go to print next month, but perhaps I'll let someone from the NESC just confirm that. Um, it's going to go to print sooner than the operational guide and design guide because it's not available online, uh, is the intention, though. Is there consideration for gradient or would this then require bespoke designs? Um, the guidance is the same as in TG 2013, so as long as the slope is less than 1 in 10, um, then the compliance sheet is okay. If the gradient is higher, then some design advice may be needed, um, just to complement uh, what's on the compliance sheet. Will there be any standard configurations available for edge protection? Oh, that's um, TG1 uh, when, that's, uh, when that's published. On the section drawing, it shows tie tubes tied to the inside standard. Will it show tie tube going through both standards? Yeah, it's quite good actually. Um, so in the um, we uh, we calculate um, when we do the compliance check uh, whether the tie tubes can go to the inner face only or whether they must be to the outer face. We also calculate whether additional structural transoms are needed at the other nodes, uh, which are not tied. And we state all of that in the text of the compliance sheet, like we did in TD 2013, but we also show it in the, um, in the, in the 3D preview uh, on the screen. Um, generally speaking with the preview, um, a lot of these details come in um, when you get to the end, uh, when the scaffold is, is sort of calculated with the compliance check. Um, so once it runs all the way through, it's calculated the wind factor, you specified the height, the cladding and so on, it will work out whether the tie tubes need to extend to the outer face and it will update the drawing uh, and, and the sort of 3D presentation accordingly. Thank you. Uh, I've just been informed the user guide is planned to be available in May. So oh, great. Okay. There you That's are. Good. That one answered. Um, here we go. Back to the questions. Uh, what is the max loading we could apply? Many real life cases require even 20k PA. Yeah, it's the same as uh, TG 2013. So for the uh, access scaffold, it's limited to, depending on the scaffold type, it might be uh, two or three kilonewtons per square meter. The loading bay is again limited to 10 kilonewtons per square meter. So if you need more than that, then uh, it would be a bespoke design for those. Okay. Uh, we're, we're down to about 15 questions left, Terry. Ooh, okay. <laughs> We've answered 90 to date. So, uh, you know. Oh, we did okay. Uh, you can have a glass of water very soon. <laughs> Thanks. Is the location chosen on the map for wind printed on the compliance sheets? Uh, oh, yes. With postcode, what three words? Yeah, it's, oh, it doesn't have the what three words, uh, but it does have the postcode and uh, it works either way around. You can, you can search for the address and it puts the pin on the map, or if you put the pin on the map, it will find the address for you. Uh, so yeah, it works both ways. How many standard designs are available in TG2021? Thousands, thousands. I did list them off. It's... Uh, uh, it's it's potentially hundreds of thousands um, because we have all the different combinations of different wind factors, uh, lift boarding conditions, scaffold heights, 
uh, whether um, whether ties with the inner face or outer face, the different planet conditions and so on and so on. It, it's, it's, it's hundreds of thousands actually. Will it give pullout test loads for ties? Uh, that's a good question. Um, so it gives the, the maximum unfactored tie duty. Um, from that, you need to work out your, your pullout load. Uh, one of the apps we're thinking about for the ePortal would be um, a sort of TG4 based app. Uh, so for anchor testing. So we are thinking about whether we can provide um, another app that can help you to work out what your pullout test load would be or what your, um, or if you're doing preliminary tests, what your, what your test load would be. So again, that's one of the ideas that's kind of floating around at the moment, but not, 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 not definite yet. Uh, but there is guidance, of course, in chapter seven of the operational guide for working that out. Is there a multi-user license option for the bigger companies? Uh, at the moment, uh, basically, each subscription is a sort of single subscription. Um, but um, if you are a large company, if you just contact the NESC, there's a much quicker way to set up multiple, multiple licenses than going through the shop and buying them all one at a time. Um, so the answer is sort of yes. Um, in the future, again, depending on how things uh, go and, and how we prioritize things, we are thinking about some sort of facilities where an administrator might be able to manage their own licenses as well. Uh, but that's sort of something that we'd, we'd probably head towards. Is in checklist mentioned the max pull test load for ties required? Ooh, similar question. Yeah, so the, the answer is sort of yes. Um, it gives you the unfactored tie duty, but you would need to multiply that uh, to get the, the pull out load. But again, we didn't want to confuse things by putting multiple tie duties on there because we, we wouldn't want them all to get, to get confused. Hi, has there been any testing of couplers to see if the 6.1, 9.1 kilonewton class AB values remain valid? Pressed V forged couplers, any difference? Um, there has been some testing, uh, as far as I'm aware, um, because of course, if your couplers are, are, are marked as being uh, EN74 compliant, class A or class B, then the manufacturer will have tested to that. So that would be the case. Um, so as long as your coupler is marked, as, as shown in, in chapter four of the operational guide, that would be true. One of the things we have uh, modified though for the design guide are the um, the structural properties for um, uh, band and plate couplers, uh, because the NAC has been doing some testing on those and they are maybe not always as reliable as you, as you might hope. So I think that testing is still in progress at the moment. So we've made some notes in the design guide, I think table uh, 5.15 about that. Um, but for um, the right angle swivel and put log couplers, they are all unchanged uh, since the previous guidance. Hi, has there been any research into the overall capacity of, say, triple couplers, all installed side by side attached to a single standard? Um, not as far as I'm aware, but um, we have introduced uh, more explicit guidance about um, supplementary and check couplers into the operational guide uh, based on the, uh, the TG that the NEC Technical Committee have written. Uh, so we've clarified that. Um, and we've also put a bit more guidance into the uh, design guide as well along those lines, but nothing on triple couplers um, in, in this edition anyway. Any provisions to cover EN13374 edge protection moving forwards? Oh yes, again, um, that will be covered in, in TG1 when that's, uh, when that's completed. In BSEN 1991 parts one to four, wind suction due to wind blowing in the parallel is considered. Are suction mm -hmm. loads due to wind blowing in the parallel condition considered in the calculation of the TG20 tie loads? Yes, very much so. Yes. In fact, um, getting all of that to work in TG2013 was the thing that kept us very occupied for a couple of years, actually. So, um, uh, yes, uh, making sure that a tube fitting scaffold actually stands up to all of that uh, by calculation was very much what we did in TG2013. Uh, again, if you look at our uh, smart calculations uh, calculation software. Um, it shows you all of the loading that's applied, um, so that you can see uh, you can see what we're doing. Great. Is there any thoughts on the inclusion of buttresses for scaffolds that cannot be tied, i.e., untied independents, etc.? Mm, yeah. Again, I think uh, you can see it's quite a long list, but I'll say it's on the list because that's that's definitely one that's that's been thought of. Um, so again, that that will depend on, on on the order that we that we do things in. Can competent scaffolders brackets slightly, move away from compliance sheets using their training and experience? Um, question. I mean, again, it's a little bit like I was saying before with the ties, the compliance sheet is very much a, a sort of idealization of the real scaffold. And so you've really got to use the compliance sheet in conjunction with 
um, let's say, all your knowledge from the operational guide um, to, to produce the real scaffold on site. And of course, really what you're saying by your uh, experience is sort of everything that we try to distill into the operational guide, uh, if you see what I mean. But what we try to do is we, we try to make it self-contained so that if you're using the compliance sheets with the operational guide, that should be everything that you need. Um, if, that, if that makes sense. If a scaffold is not over the base to height ratio, can it be erected without ties? If so, why is it not mentioned on the e-guide? Um, if it's, uh, well, it, perhaps explicit for the bird cages and, and the, some of the freestanding towers, with the independent scaffold, that's an additional thing that we've added in TG2021. So um, if your scaffold, if you have an independent scaffold that's one lift tall, uh, we check the overturning of that and we advise whether it can be freestanding or whether you need uh, rakers or ties. Uh, so that's an additional check. In the TG2013 e-guide, we never showed uh, an illustration of a scaffold that was just one lift tall. It always had a, a, a few lifts and therefore some ties. Uh, one thing to bear in mind is in section 6.23 of the operational guide, in the section on rakers, it does give some additional guidance if you do have a single lift independent scaffold that is not tied or rakered. Um, it provides some guidance about the, uh, the direction of the ledger bracing uh, and also there's a requirement uh, potentially for underslung structural transoms. Um, so please take a look at that. Okay, uh, a couple more questions left uh, if you're happy. I think we'll, we'll close the session yeah. off at half past 11. If there's, if there's any questions um, outstanding, uh, we'll, we'll answer them and uh, send them around in an email to all participants, if that's okay. Uh, thanks for the update reband and plates. Any news on grav locks, please? Um, nothing that I'm aware of, but um, no, nothing, that I'm, nothing that I'm aware of, but I'll, I'll let you know if, um, if anything comes up. Um, one thing we have done, again, in the operational guide, we have clarified, uh, we had a very, very tiny section of grab locks in, in the TG2013 operational guide, we've, we've improved that a little bit for the, the new guidance. Uh, thanks for the clarification, re-multiple couplers. What about a ladder beam with a coupler on the top cord and a coupler on the bottom cord? Both couple of connections to the same standard, but not touching each other. Any thoughts on capacity, please? Um, yeah, I can't say that that's anything that we've that we've put in. Um, I'm not even I'm not aware of I'm not aware of any sort of test results on that or anything. So it's it's not really something that we've looked at for uh, the current guide. But the main thing we have done, though, again, uh, for example, in the loading bay guidance, um, in the previous guidance, we would specify where you need. Um, uh, for example, supplementary couplers, but in the new guidance, we've provided a, a lot more help about the conditions where you don't really need a supplementary coupler because, for example, you've already got an underslung, um, uh, underslung lacing tube or structural transom connected to the standards. Um, so I think the new guide is slightly more sympathetic to the kind of real construction conditions uh, in, in those circumstances. Okay. Um, has the TG guidance been changed to reflect two to three millimetre industry base plates and not four to five millimetre ones? No, uh, there's been some discussion about that actually, but um, the four to five millimetre ones are recommended uh, for the load transfer from the scaffold down to the sole boards. Um, I'm not, um, I think some testing would be required really for the, for the thinner base plates. Uh, okay, last one then. Uh, is a birdcage that is open to the top compliant, say new house build? Oh, um, that's a very good question. If it, if it has any wind exposure, then I would use the external. Yeah, you can use the new external birdcage. Now, previously that wouldn't really have been included. Um, but yes, so if you use the external birdcage um, compliance sheet, that would be fine. Great stuff. Uh, Terry, you have answered 109 questions. Uh, uh, maybe a record. So much, uh, <laughs> okay. for that. Um, I'm sure the, the, the delegates have got a lot of uh, kind of information in a short period of time. So invaluable. Thank you very much for your time.